Hey there, in this video we are talking about advanced mathematical functions in C++ and also techniques for debugging, finding and fixing errors in a C++ program. This covers sections 3.9 to 3.11 in the Gaddis C++ book. So let's talk about math functions. Previously we looked at basic arithmetic operators, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. We know that that basically works the same way you would expect in normal math. You can put down parentheses when you need to group things properly. Floating point and integer division in particular, that works differently, so you need to be careful about that. But here we want to look at more advanced math functions like you'd need in pre-calculus or trigonometry or calculus or something like that. So there's a series of math library functions for those kinds of jobs. Common mathematical functions are defined in the CMath header file. So uh, those are all the math functions that come from the C language originally, so that's why it's called CMath. Now, each of these functions has a short little summary name. They take one double parameter in their parentheses for input, and when, when they get done with their calculation, they return a double value. Let me just see the list here that we're talking about today and make one other comment about that. So most of these functions have like a, a three-letter, three or four-letter abbreviation for them. There's the ABS function for absolute value. There's the square root function for taking a square root. There's SIN for the sine function. These are trigonometry now, obviously. There's COS for cosine. There's TAN for tangent. So these all work the way that you expect. Obviously, ABS returns something that doesn't have any negative sign on it. Uh, keep in mind that square roots, if you try to pass in a negative number to that, that's going to be a runtime error because you cannot take the square root of a negative number and come back with a double precision real number. Um, uh, now for the trigonometry function, sine, cosine, tangent, that's this additional note here, inputs to trigono trigonometric functions are always in radians. That's sort of the natural, simple way of measuring angles in, in math, actually, so they are set up the same way you would expect. Uh, just to talk very briefly about that, the reason why we like radians is if you have a unit circle, radius one circle, and you take, you, you take out a sector that's one radian, that's the measurement of the angle, well, the arc length over here is going to be exactly the same as the radius. It's going to be exactly one. So one radian angle arc length of exactly one. That's so convenient. And that's why we set up our functions to take radians because of that convenience. Probably in a calculus class, you'd see a little bit more detail about that, but that's why uh, things are set up that way. So here's a little bit of review. I'm just going to quiz you about that. Hopefully you know enough about your basic math functions there to answer this. Now, let's assume for the little bit of code you're about to see that there's been a prior declaration, a constant double called pi, and all uppercase because this is a constant, that's been set to 3.14159265.4, um, which you can use when you want to. So here's some algebraic expressions like you would see in math, right? And we're going to think about how would you have to write this as a C++ function call. Well, in that first one, of course, those bars indicate absolute value. So what I want to do here is call the ABS function for absolute value. I would write ABS, parentheses, A minus B. And that would compute A minus B, send it into the absolute value function, strip off any negative at that point, and come back with the positive version of that number is what that would do. So maybe you can answer the other ones. Maybe pause the video here, see if you can write down the C++ version of these other, these other mathematical expressions. And when you think you have the answers, restart the video and we'll see if we agree. Okay, do you have answers to that? So this next one is, of course, the area of a circle. And that's something we've done in our class in a lab at this point, pi times radius squared. So for radius squared, we now have the pow function. We saw that last time, actually. For the radius squared, I would do pow r comma two and then that I would multiply by pi. So that's what I have there, pi times the result of pow r comma two, which is getting you the radius squared. Uh, the next one obviously has a square root, so I'm gonna have to write sqrt for the square root function, parentheses s over n, is how you have that. You know, little side note, the bar on top of the radicand there in the math writing, uh, that's actually how they used to represent grouping, uh, I would say, before parentheses were invented. So it makes sense that the bar on top is turning in parentheses here 
and the radical symbol is turning into the SQRT function name. Okay, now next, next two are a little bit tricky, right? How do you compute the cosine of 180 degrees? Well, you cannot call cos 180 because that would be handing in degrees, and that's not how the cos function works. You've got to hand in the number of radians. So hopefully you know enough trigonometry uh, to answer uh, 180 degrees is how many radians? Well, that's half a circle, right? And, and pi gets you halfway around a circle, as a matter of fact. So if you call cosine pi, pi approximately three radians is half of a circle. So that's how that works. And we're gonna have to do something similar for this tangent calculation, right? 45 degrees, um, that is, that's half of a right angle. So I guess that's an eighth, that's an eighth of a full circle. Um, so what would that be? I guess that would be tangent of pi over four, right? If pi radians is half of a circle, what I want here is a quarter of that. So tangent of pi over four would be the correct number of radians for 45 degrees. And of course the function would actually calculate the tangent of that and come back and report that as a double precision decimal number. So that's, that's handy. If you ever need to do, we're not going to do a whole lot of that in this class, frankly. I don't think we're going to do a lot of trigonometry, certainly. But just keep that in mind. That's available on the day when you do need to do more sophisticated math. There are other functions in the CMath library, and you can look it up online, what, what the other options are. Um, but that is uh, what we commonly use for those kinds of jobs. Okay, another thing, uh, random numbers, right? Random numbers are surprisingly important in computing. Um, random numbers, you really need them in lots of applications. Now, my prior field of video games uses them a lot. If I'm making a card game or dice or random monsters showing us being spawned in a role-playing game, I'm going to need random numbers dictating when these things are appearing. They're incredibly important for encryption, uh, sending secure information online, actually. You need, to, you need to get a key that is probably developed by uh, random number generation. Statistical sampling, when you're doing scientific studies, you don't want a biased sample, so you probably want a random number generator to pick who gets into your study for that purpose. So many important reasons why you want random numbers. Okay, so here's how you do that in C++. Now, to be clear, these aren't going to be really truly random numbers. Uh, what I ought to be calling these are pseudo-random numbers, because the truth is, underneath the hood, there's just a mathematical formula that's getting calculated every time you want a number. So you need to start with one number, and there'll be a calculation, and that'll produce another number that'll probably be surprising or hard to predict. And if you want another one, then you take that number and you throw that into the calculation and it churns out another number that's probably surprising or hard to predict. So to begin with, to get that initial number, there's a function called srand, which stands for seed the randomizer. Seed being the initial thing that these random numbers are growing out of. So srand for seed the randomizer. You have to call that first. What are you going to put in the parentheses? Well, basically, you want just any number, right? You want any number that's not predictable. So what a lot of us do is we call the time function, which gets the current clock time on the system. And I actually think that's reported in like number of seconds since the start of 1980, something like that. But the point is that the, the function called time, uh, when you send in zero, is going to report the current clock time. And therefore, that will be different every time you run the program. Unless you're so incredibly fast at running the program, you can do it twice in the same second. Okay, as long as you can't do that, you'll be starting with a different number every time as you seed the randomizer, and therefore different runs of the application will be developing different numbers. Now, in order to access that, srand is in the C standard library, C-S-T-D-L-I-B for short, and the time function that gets the current clock time in seconds, that's in the C time library. So you would have to include both of these things in order to start off your randomizer like that. Okay, so at this point, you've got the first number in the pseudo-random no, pseudo calculator that does this job. Now, when you want to actually get a random number, very simple, the function call is rand, rand for randomizers. Doesn't take any parameters, right? You still need the parentheses so that C++ knows this is a function call, but this is a function that doesn't take any parameters at all, so you just leave the parentheses empty. And this does that calculation behind the scenes and spits out a random integer, and every single call to that generates a new number in this pseudo-random sequence. 
little detail on that. I think that the calculator in um, that we in our compiler is actually using a short int, I believe. That's only two bytes long. And if you remember, we talked about that. If you're using a short int, the numbers only go up to about 32,000. So this RAND function here only spits out numbers somewhere between zero and about 32,000 all the time. So keep that in mind. There are more advanced random number generators in the world. This is such an important issue for games and encryption and statistical sampling that people do lots and lots of studies and lots of advanced research on the best possible random numbers. And um, you can investigate that more later in your career, I'm sure. But just for starters, this is what's historically built into C++. Here's an example program of this, program 325 in the book. This program demonstrates random numbers, very, very simple. And you can see we've got, uh, we're including IO stream for SYN and COUT. We had to include the C standard library for RAND and SRAND. And we're also including C time to get the current clock time is the very first thing we put into the pseudo random generator. And I guess they're doing this in two separate steps here. They're calling the time function to get the current time putting that in a variable called seed. Uh, that's actually an unsigned int because the, um, the return value from time is an unsigned int, so they're trying to be compatible with that. Once they've got that number in seed, again, just the first number in the series of calculations, they pass that into the random seed function, seeding the randomizer there, like we said. And then on line 16, 17, 18, they're gonna call rand once, twice, a third time. And hopefully, if you understand what we're saying here, you would expect these to be three different, hopefully unpredictable numbers. We should try that. Okay, so here is this program 325 that demonstrates random numbers. And again, we are seeding the random number generator with an initial number that comes out of the clock time. And then we're gonna call rand three times and get three different random numbers from this pseudo random calculation that's really happening. Uh, let's compile this and then run it, see what we got. Okay, so the three numbers that we got here are 416 and 32,025 and 24,480. Remember I said that the highest number you're ever gonna see is approximately 32,000. So that middle number there is about as big a number as you're gonna see out of this system as possible. Okay, so 416 and then some bigger numbers. Let's try this again. And hopefully your expectation would be to, that you're gonna see different numbers and here's what happens this time. We got 508, 5,300, and 389. Okay, so every single time you run this, you are gonna get a different series of three numbers because the clock time is different. It's a different second. And therefore, this series of calculations is starting off with a different initial number. And that is what a random number generator ought to do. Now, one I say weakness, I think you might spot here, is that that first number isn't changing a lot, right? I mean, that's 580, and on the next run, it's 625, and if I do this kind of quickly, now it's 635, right? And now it's 648. Now, the other numbers are varying uh, more widely and are kind of uh, harder to predict. The very first call to RAND uh, seems a little bit easy to predict at the moment, and that's because uh, the, the clock time is only going up by a couple seconds. So this is effectively starting off with a fairly similar first number in the series each time. So, you know, a lot of people would say that this, this classic old school random number generator that's built in C++, which is originally in C, is not the strongest, not the best randomizer. So there are other randomizers in the world, other libraries that you could look at that probably do a better job, frankly, than this. But this is what's available in um, uh, the C language. This is the most basic way you can do that. And so for a very simple like, like game or something like that, it's okay, it's fine. Um, and probably people aren't gonna be running the program again and again and again and again in a couple seconds like I did. So this is fine for a beginning program, but for serious heavy duty work, you probably would want a more advanced uh, pseudo random number generator. I will also say that, uh, you know, we could talk about the math formula that actually does that. We're not going to do that in this class. Uh, we would leave that for a future class, probably discrete mathematics at uh, CUNY Kingsborough. That's our CS3500 course. I actually go into what the math is, as a matter of fact, but we'll leave that for another course. 
Okay, and here's the other thing we want to talk about today. Uh, techniques for debugging programs. Um, as our programs get a little bit more complicated, making sure that we can mentally understand what's happening in them, and if something surprises, surprising happens, have some kind of backup plan for determining what's actually happening internally in our program. So for starters, we ought to be able to hand trace our programs. And hand tracing means mentally, just as a human being, um, stepping through the steps of the program and following what those instructions say to do ourselves. Maybe we would use pencil and paper to keep track of what's in the various variables in memory um, would be a good idea. Some people refer to this process as desk checking. I think maybe in the old days when computers were more rare and you had to like go to another building in order to get access to the supercomputer, uh, if you were still in your office at the desk, you could take your program and role play the part of the computer, go through the program and do it yourself and, and desk check, so to speak, before you actually took it to the main computer. Uh, recall, uh, hopefully this is very obvious, recall that programs run one statement at a time in order from top to bottom. Right? And they're going to line 10 and then line 11 and line 12 and then line 13, one at a time. It's not like they're all happening all at once. Even though computers are so fast, you might get that illusion that they're all happening at once. And then probably on a piece of paper, I would want to record the values of any variables as they get assigned or updated or sinned or something like that, right? So the thing that I'm emphasizing on this slide is you cannot look at a program, and we want to understand programs, but you cannot look at a program and just guess the output of a whole program at once. You are going to need to slow down and be patient and patiently inspect every line one at a time, one after the other in the right order, right? And that's the only way that you can possibly really understand what programs are doing because that's what's happening on the CPU. Okay, so let's try that hand tracing process ourselves. I am pulling up program 327 out of the book and we're gonna see that on screen in just a second here. Um, and the question I wanna ask is, is this program correct? And when I say correct, I mean, does the program actually produce the correct result for the input that the user gives it? In this case, this does have some sin statements for user input. Let's assume that the user is typing in 10 and 20 and 30 uh, when this program runs. All right, so first of all, you wanna understand what the goal is and the comment at the top tells us that. This program asks for three numbers and then it displays the average of the three numbers. And again, the question at the end will be, does this actually output the correct average. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna start walking through the statements to this program in the main function, thinking about what the action is, and I'll make a little table on the side that records what's being stored in each of the variables. So first of all, line eight, right? Line eight declares several double precision floating point values. There's num1, num2, num3, and avg for average. And you know, before I go anywhere else, I might ask the question, right this second on line eight, what is being stored in num1? Maybe think about that for a second. What is being stored in num1 right now? And the correct answer is random garbage, right? We have not initialized num1 and we haven't assigned anything. And at that point, there's probably some other bits in there. That space might've gotten used by some other program a couple minutes ago. And I don't know what's in num1. It might be zero, it might be 16, it might be negative 1,000. Okay, but right this second, at the moment that line eight is happening, random garbage is in num1. I don't know what it is, but let's go on from there. Then the program goes on to line 10, and obviously that prompts the user, enter the first number. I'm about to start documenting my variables here. Line 11 happens with a sin statement, and we're assuming at that point the user types in 10, and now we know it's in num1, because num1 just got a 10 cent into it. Then line 12 happens and it prompts the user, please enter a second number. Line 13 happens and at that sin statement, the user types in 20 and that's what goes into num2. Okay, makes sense. You get to line 14, right, one line after the other. Line 14 happens, you prompt the user, please enter a third number. User types in a number 30 and we can see that's being sent into num3. Great. Now we're on line 16. The right-hand side of the equal happens, right? We do num1 plus num2 plus num3 divided by three, and the result of that goes into AVG. What is that? Well, it's 40, right? Because don't forget about the order of operations. The order of operations says the division happens first. So what's happening on the CPU is num3, the 30, 
gets divided by 3 for 10. And then that addition expression happens, and you're going to do 10 plus 20 plus the 10 we just came up with, and 10 plus 20 plus 10 is actually 40, and that goes into average. And then line 17 happens, and it says the average is 40, is what this program is going to happen, is going to say. So uh, let's return to our initial question. Is this program correct? No, that's not the average of 10, 20, and 30. The correct average is 20, right? That is an incorrect program. Now, I have modified that from the book, right? If you look in the Gaddis book and you look at program 327, this is not what's actually in there. I modified this a little bit in order to make this curveball here. But the truth is this program, as we see it on screen right here, is not correct. It does not produce the correct average. And you can probably tell me what the correct fix to that was, right? In the averaging calculation on line 16, uh, you need to do the additions first, and then you do the division. So what you really need here is you need parentheses around the num1, num2, num3 sum to have that happen first, then do the division by 3. Then in that case, in this example, you actually would get 20 for the average. 10, 20, and 30, add up to 60, divide that by 3, you get the 20, which is correct. Then that would be a correct program. Okay, but again, we very carefully hand traced it, role played what the CPU would do, do very carefully one line at a time, and we could spot where the problem was, because num1, num2, num3, they're hold, all holding the right numbers. It's the AVG calculation that was incorrect. And then we could kind of focus in on where we needed to fix it. Now, so we make sure you can do this kind of thing. This is what we expect for programmers that you can read and mentally process a program like this makes for great test questions. This will probably be on every test you ever take in computer science program. Um, so be ready for this. And it's just expected behavior that a programmer can read and understand what the program's doing. For an experienced programmer, they can probably just scan it very quickly, come up with this answer. But keep in mind, we are still going one line at a time through the code, uh, just like the CPU does. There's no magic thing that you can look at 20 lines and know what's going to happen. You do have to mentally go through it carefully one line at a time. Well, let's take a look at something a little bit more powerful than that, actually. I have pulled up that program 327 uh, into the ID here. Now, this is the correct version. This is not the one that I intentionally broke uh, for an experiment. This is the correct version of uh, program 327 there. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a facility called the debugger. We mentioned that that's an important part of our IDE uh, at uh, near the beginning of the course, actually. So here's the editor. I'm usually typing stuff. Here's the compile log that we're reading carefully. And now I'm going to start using this tab here that's labeled debug. So what I can do here is I have the option of instead of running the program at full speed, and again, my processor here I think is a speed of 4 gigahertz, which is to say it does 4 billion operations per second, faster than a human being can follow, obviously, is we can slow it down and we can have the IDE do one statement and then stop. And so we can kind of look and inspect at what's happening so far and do the whole program actually one line at a time. It's actually a really good tool for kind of understanding how our programs actually work to begin with. So you might consider using this yourself sometime. If I'm going to use this, first of all, I have to put what's called a breakpoint. I have to tell the system, uh, you know, normally you're going to start running full speed. Where do you first pause it? So I'm going to go to the very first line in the main function, and I'm going to click on toggle breakpoint. Okay, so toggle means if it's off, turn it on. If it's on, turn it off. Okay, so this highlights this with this check mark here that there's currently a breakpoint, and when the processing the program hits this, we're going to temporarily pause. Now, in DevC++, I could actually just click on the line number, and that happens automatically. Right? Click on 8, now it's a breakpoint. Click on it again, now it's not. I can just do this. So having done that, and I think I compiled it here a second ago, um, under the Execute menu, I'm going to click on Debug. Right? Or you could just click on this purple check mark on the, uh, the toolbar here. We'll do the same thing. So let's click on Debug. All right, so this has started running the program. You get kind of a couple extra buttons on the interface down here. The console for the output is on my other monitor. I'll just bring that over here. Kind of size that so it's nicely visible. Now you can see nothing's been printed on the monitor yet on the console. 
because we are currently on this line 10 that's highlighted in blue, and we are waiting for my command to actually do line 10 on its own. And that's the line that's gonna print the first prompt onto the console. Now, before I do that, what I can do is, is the concept of a watch, which says for some particular variable, I would like to watch what the contents are in memory. So I'm gonna do that for all four of our variables. I'm gonna click on add watch, it says enter the variable name, uh, and then some information that will be important in programming semester two, but certainly not now. So I wanna keep track of the num1 variable. Okay, and so that pops up over here in the debug panel, and you can see that, remember we said the first time that we enter this program before any input happens, num1 will be holding random garbage. There'll be some series of bits that are on or off. I don't know what it will be. And it turns out in this particular case, with this run of the program, that num1 starts off holding the number 6.6081082505008389 times 10 to the negative 317th power, written in exponent notation there. Now, I think you agree that is not a number that anybody would possibly guess is sitting in num1 to begin with. But that kind of highlights what I mean by random garbage. If you don't initialize a variable before you assign anything to it, it just holds a random number, basically. And that's what's happening in num1. Let's look at the other ones. Here's num2. Again, crazy number, not the same one, right? 2.9 times 10 to the negative 322nd power. These are doubles, of course, and the exponents do go up to something like 350 for the power maximum or something like that. Uh, let's look at num3. Again, crazy scientific expo scientific notation, uh, double precision number there, uh, different from num1, num2. And then we also have that AVG variable. And that's also starting off with random garbage, right? Approximately 7.9 times 10 to the negative 323 power, right? And that's just what variables do. That's what happens. I suppose you could have made C++ like stuff zeros in all the variables, but that would take extra time on the CPU and C++ doesn't play like that, right? We want everything to be super fast and super efficient for when you're managing an AI car or a rocket ship or something like that. So you're on your own about that stuff. Now let's actually start running the lines. So if I click on the next line button here, it's gonna run line 10 specifically and then stop again. So I'll just do this. You see, I get that prompt, enter the first number on the console. And now we've got line 11 highlighted. That's the next thing that's gonna happen. I'll hit next line again. So now line 11 is happening, but of course that's a sin statement. So it's waiting for the user in the console to actually type something in. And we agreed previously that we we're gonna type in 10 for that input. Now over in the debug panel, you can see that the 10 is actually showing up in the num1 variable location. So now we know what's gonna be in there and you can actually see the 10 being stored there. Uh, line 12 is about to happen. I hit next line, right? It prompts the user for enter the second number. Now we're about to do line 13, click next line. That's waiting now for some user input. I'll come over here and type in 20 and you can see where that's gonna go over into num2 of course. All right, so now num2 is holding the number 20. Uh, next line this, here's that third prompt. All right, here's this third sin statement, and I'm gonna type in 30 for that. So now num3 has the 30. Of course, AVG at this moment still holds random garbage because we haven't done line 16 yet. About to do that right now. So when I hit line, uh, uh, next line here, the calculation happens. That actually is a correct calculation. The number will get put in AVG. Let's see that happen. Yep, okay, so AVG just got the number 20 as a result of 16. Nothing got printed from that line, right? That's a processing line, so it changed some numbers in memory. And now, when I hit next line, line 17 will happen, and it ought to print out the average is 20. There you go. Great. And probably another couple steps here for the end line that's happening. And now you hit return zero, which is sending back that code to Windows to say we had zero errors, we're perfectly fine and a couple other steps here, and the program will finish. Great, I don't need this breakpoint anymore. So that's kind of handy, right? So, so, you know, for a simple program like this, the expectation is you shouldn't need to use this. You should be able to hand trace this and just mentally track 
the state of all the variables to understand what the code is doing. But for more complicated programs, and I'm talking programs that are hundreds of lines long or 100,000 lines long, right, with hundreds of different variables, then it becomes a lot easier to lose track of uh, what's happening in memory and you need a more heavy duty solution like this software debugger. So that's very handy. But for our beginning class, I will turn to this once in a while just to be patient and carefully step through the lines and see exactly what's happening. And I do feel that that is occasionally a useful demonstration to see what's actually happening internally. So expect to see that from time to time. Okay, so that's the end of this section of chapter three, and we've got some pretty good tools here. We looked at some sophisticated math functions like absolute value and square root and trigonometry for when you need to do that. We looked at random numbers, which are important in games and encryption and scientific sampling and things like that. So you know about that if you ever need it. And we also talked about techniques for debugging our programs by hand tracing and maybe using the software debugger that's in Dev C++ or other IDEs if you have access to that and get in a pinch, frankly. So at this point in my course, uh, I'd have an in-person session where uh, my students do this lab on arithmetic operators and math functions and get to practice that kind of stuff. As you can see, the goal of this program is gonna be to have a program where the user enters the length of two legs of a right triangle, and the program is supposed to compute and output the length of the hypotenuse. Um, so in order to do this, you need to know what the mathematical relationship is between those things. And if you didn't, I guess you could look it up on Google. You're supposed to know it at this point in your academic career. And then on paper, you're going to have to do a little bit of algebra to convert the normal formula into a formula that specifically computes the hypotenuse. So knowing some geometry, I guess doing a little bit of algebra, and then translating that math formula into C++. And those are pretty basic things that you need when you're a programmer. So that's what's gonna happen in this lab. As usual, I would have my students uh, write a test script with maybe increasingly complicated input. Maybe I start with the input is the two legs have lengths three and four. And most of us should know what the length of the hypotenuse is with that. And then I would have slightly more complicated numbers. Maybe I would actually have uh, input that's decimal values. And for that, I'd have to double check with a hand calculator probably. And we would run this program multiple times, of course, one, two, three, four, five times with different input and make sure that the results actually match what it's supposed to be mathematically. So a pretty good example of standard program development. Now, when we come back next time, we're gonna finish up chapter three with a discussion of data type conversions. That's a little bit of a more complicated topic, so I've left it for the end. We have a whole bunch of different data types. We have integers and floats and short ints and doubles and chars and all kinds of stuff like that. And the question there will be, what happens if you have all different kinds of data all built into a calculation? How does C++ manage comparing or combining different data types. So that's kind of an interesting, very important discussion next time, and I'll see you then for that.